Okay, I think we're ready to start. Good morning, everybody. So happy to see you here. So early in the morning as well. <laughs> morning shift, that's always tricky. Even more tricky when the talk is going to be highly non-technical at a technical conference. So I hope you're ready for that. If you're not, then you're free to leave. <laughs> I'm not going to keep you here. Uh, because this is going to be, uh, as I said, non-technical. It's going to be actually somewhat theoretical. Maybe in some even claim philosophical. Um, but the thing is why I think we need that. Sorry. Um, it's because I, I have, I've done a lot of talks on modularity the last few years. I've done this a few times before as well, and there has been some reactions to that uh, specific thing. There is no recipe here. If you want to know how, exactly how you're going to split your monolith, I don't have the recipe for you, unfortunately. Uh, if I did, I'd probably be a really rich man, but I'm not. So there, but, and that's why I sort of um, have doing these modularization talks, because I've, I've done modularization since the, like, the early, mid-2000s. By the way, sorry for not introducing myself, Tron Jotland here from Norway, he, him. Um, but, but since I've done this for quite a few, few years, I've come to realize that this is really hard thing, things to do. It's hard, and if you do it wrong, it can be really detrimental to, to, to your solutions and your business even. So I've looked into system thinking quite a bit. And when you move into system thinking, sort of a new uh, world almost opens up to you. And then you see that not only are we uh, uh, sort of trapped by the way of our thinking, which means that we actually have to change our thinking a little bit. Not just a little bit, actually, quite radically some, sometimes. And that means that we have to go into theory and also philosophical, because that is what's forming our, our thinking. I think somebody said, if you, uh, if you said, oh, I don't care about the theoretical stuff, I just do stuff. Like, I'm just being pragmatic and just doing stuff. You're actually automating what you, you already have a theoretical frame of mind when you do that. And I think that the frame of mind we have is actually quite harming, harmful, for what but for especially for modularity, actually. Um, so what I'm, what I'm proposing here, though, is that we look into system thinking, and then by doing that, we need to think more holistically about our, so our, our solutions and, and our domains that we're working in. And I think we've been too, too stuck in a technical imperative, so to speak. Um, and a good example of this is that we will always think about efficiency and how to make uh, value flow fast as fast as possible and all that stuff. That is actually quite mechanistic thinking. That if, you, if, you, if, you, if you take a frame in mind as a world hypothesis, if you like, we see it as a, ma as a machine that we need to run as efficiently as possible. So it saves money, right? It's a cost center, so to speak. So, th so that is something that becomes obvious when you move into system thinking because that is, becomes a really apparent. And also, uh, since we also talk about tech a lot, I think we actually lose a lot of the social aspects of what we're doing. That is also something that has been become apparent for me after doing the, so the, the, the system thinking uh, investigations, so to speak. Because as, as uh, Jeepo Hill said, social development inherently a social technical enterprise, as he called it. So there's so there is technical and there's social. And they are Combined, you can't take them away from each other. You can't, if, and if you do that, then I think we have the risk of, as I said, thinking in machines. So that's why I use this proverb to illustrate this point. Because I think when we motorize, we should create boundaries like we create fences. I'm not sure how many of you actually are familiar with these stone fences that I've illustrated here. I grew up on the west coast of Norway. I'm actually a farmer's boy, so I've seen a lot of these. Climb them on numerous times. So, uh, but but the, 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 good, the cool thing about them, they are put in place for a reason. And they are also not walls, they are fences. So if you live in a, in a more uh, rural area, or oh, sorry, a uh, populated area, you probably have picket fences and all that stuff. Similar ideas. So, so, uh, so, uh, yeah, so imagine the farm has fences for the outside world, like your company would have fences to your outside world. Right? Because a farm is a company, basically. It's a small company given, given but it's a company. So they have, they have sort of boundaries to the outside world. They are probably more solid, like this one. But they are not walls. They are still fences. But they are a sort of a governing constraint. This is my land, that's your land. Fine, we agree on that, right? But we also use fence, stone fences within a farm. For example, between the cultivated area and, and the non-cultivated area, the outlands. Just to keep your, uh, your cows out of your cornfield, so to speak, right? You don't want that. 
So then you put it in for a reason, and that's, an, that's sort of an enabling constraint, not a governing constraint, if you want to use those terms. And about these boundaries then. Because they, the, the boundaries doesn't exist in real life. We put them in for a reason. And as, as the Buckminster Fuller said, American architect, designer, I think I said, you have to remember that they are useful fiction. So they are not, they, we often try to find where are they. Of course, the boundaries should be there. There should be a good place to put them, right? But that's not necessarily, not necessarily true. We put them in for a reason, and that reason can actually change also. So the, at some point, the boundaries may make sense, and then, for example, oh, and I, we, we are going to cultivate more area, so I have to move the stone fence because, <laughs> right? You see? So, so then they shouldn't be seen as hard. And that's actually something that I come up for me as well, because uh, I've done, as I said, uh, modularity for, for since the mid-2000s. I think there was service-oriented architecture that sort of captured my first uh, ideas on this. Um, <clears throat> and I think that we think that we see them as something hard. We put them in and say, this is how it's going to be, and this is, this is the best way. But then we have done something that's reductionistic in a system thinking uh, uh, way of framing things. That's re reductionistic. We have put something in that's not really necessarily there forever. It's going to change. I'm going to move into that later on. And I think we underestimate how hard this is. Probably good proof is that we have been trying to do this modularity since the 70s, still not getting it right, so to speak. Right. Because there is no right, right? <laughs> so, and I, I think if we do this haphazardly, as I think we actually do a lot, it can be detrimental. So it's still worth it. And I definitely do think it's worth it. I'm still an advocating for modularity. I think we actually we have no choice. We have to do it. But how can we do it in a way that actually makes sense? Not only for, and not thinking as a machine, and thinking that it's hard, but more as a social system. So I'm going to argue for modularity here, actually, from a, from a mainly a non-technical non perspective. And as I said in the introduction, there's a reason why I want to do that. I think we underestimate the social aspects of modularity. So let's try to give some reasons there. We can start with. A good one? I mean, we do this every day, probably. I do it all the time. I have issues at home, issues at work. I try to separate those as much as I can, for example. Like, you put in boundaries between things because you, want, you can't cope with everything at the same time. Or just a simple thing as doing two things at the same time, multitasking as this was. I can't multitask. I can be honest about that. I, I'm not good at context switching either, so I have, when I multitask, I do things badly, both of them or more of that. Some are better than that than others, but then I think they're good at context switching, not multitasking really. So firstly, it's a coping mechanism to dealing with complexity, modularity. And this is, this, is, this is something we can't get away from. We do that. Oh, that's human nature, basically. So it's great for problem solving. And that goes into uh, cognitive load theory. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, because it's a, it's a huge field in, uh, in uh, psychology. But there's some interesting aspects there I think we should look at. And this is uh, mainly useful for when, when, you, when you try to learn new stuff. And there's things that, that can affect the way you learn it. And, and, then, and the reason is because they have realized that the cognitive load means that the, that the cognitive load is limited. There's a limited capacity, and there's limited duration to how much things you can keep in your head at the same time. So there's ways to sort of deal with this. And there's called extraneous load. You want to minimize that as much as possible. That's, that's the unnecessary things that you sort of, uh, that you really don't bring you new insight, but you have to go through. A good example is when I do, when I, before, when during COVID, I had to do online talks, and being scared for the whole talk if the network is going to fall down or not. That's something I shouldn't have to care about when I do a presentation. That's extraneous comment loved. And of course, it ruins my presentation. Not that I necessarily A said it uh, otherwise, but it definitely didn't, didn't help. Then you have what they call germane cognitive load. That one to actually maximize. That's when you, uh, um, when you learn new things, you want to map it to something that you already know, because that's faster, more, more efficient. Of course, there's a huge gotcha there, and that's called biases, right? When you say, oh, this looks just like, like Microsoft's. Microsoft just looks like service-oriented architecture. 
It's very similar, but it's not the same. And then there's the intrinsic cognitive load. That is sort of the inherent uh, uh, load of what you're trying to learn. And there, I think, modularity is part of, that's where you need it. <clears throat> because you want to com compartmentalize your domain or your problem space so much that you can focus on one thing as, uh, as, as in isolation as possible without caring about the other things. But again, as I said in the introduction, that's reductionistic in a system way of thinking. Coming back to that later. But it does give us focus, and we can keep away the irrelevant things. So that was the second. So, um, so that was the first. The second one is scaling an organization. If you're in a huge growth, if your co company is growing fast, it's easier to create new teams than extending the existing teams. Because when you're pulling new people to an existing team, the team change. It's, there is always a huge load before you so you get the efficiency that some people think they're going to get by adding new people to the teams. So it's better to create new teams, right? So that's scaling, growing faster. That's the second. The third one is you want to remove the connections between the teams, the coordination costs, so to speak. So one each one team can, can sort of work in isolation from the others as much as possible. Going back, go back to, to how that could work. You've probably seen somewhere that Jeff Bezos said that communication is terrible. It sounds very counterintuitive, but I think he inherently is a system thinker, actually. That's probably why Amazon is doing so well, <laughs> I think. What he means by that is that communication between the, team, between the teams, like his services, is, is something that you want to get rid of or reduce as much as possible, because that hinders your flow, the flow of the teams, so the independence of the team, the autonomy of the teams. You want to re reduce that as much as possible. So if you hear that, well, we need to communicate a better between the teams, that's an anti-systemic thinking. That is like a machine that doesn't, the part doesn't fit well. That is actually something that you want. You do not want to be better at, con at communication. You want to remove it as much as possible. And if, if there's a lot of talk, oh, there's a lot of politics in this company. There's a lot of conflicts, personal conflicts between the teams, for example. And uh, there's competition. Some team is fighting for for for, for, the, for the, 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 the fighting with another team, for example. And there's a lot of errors. All these are actually signals that there is something systemically wrong. And it's not because the teams are bad. It's just the communication between the and the teams are probably too high. Um, yes. So there's also the need for speed, of course, the, 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 the sort of the business want to go fast. And if we, ha if we arrive at the, the situation we had earlier with the separate teams or in, in semi-autonomous teams, they actually can go faster, but the company can go faster because the team can go independently of each other. They can release it independently, they can work independently, uh, they don't have to coordinate uh, like a quarterly release or yearly release, go a bit, or safe, you're saying. Right? So you want that. So uh, uh, by removing the waste, so to speak, you, the, the company can actually get faster time to market. But you probably see where I'm getting with this. There's some mud here. <laughs> because business agility is constrained by our technical uh, agility, often. You can't be agile if you have to fight your architecture. That is, if you have to wade through mud, you're not going to go fast. And this is a great quote from uh, the Big Ball of Mud paper. It's quite dated somewhat dated, but it's still relevant. So I recommend you to look it up, Foot and Yoda. But what they said there is really brilliant. Sadly, architecture has been undervalued for so long that many engineers regard life with a, uh, with a big boil of mud as normal. Has, there are some changes in the last few years, probably because of microservices, actually. Because in the mid-2000s, or actually before that, in the early 2000s when I worked on a big monolith, we were actually proud how many lines of code we had in that monolith. We used that as an argument for, rec for recruiting new people. Come and work with the biggest, most complex system in Norway. I don't think we would use that as an argument to get people in today, right? So things have changed with microservices, and that did not happen with SOA. Why is microservices is different? So that's the fourth. Modelize your architecture. Loose coupling, high cohesion, all that good stuff. And uh, just to be clarified, the non-technical things are still relevant. I'm not saying that they're irrelevant. Like, for example, app time, uh, scalability, and all that stuff. That's necessary, but not sufficient when you modularize. That's my opinion. But this stuff, the architecture is important. I just want to add one extra one, actually, that I came across quite recently. is uh, Dr. Carlis Baldwin. 
Uh, she's written a book called Design Rules. I haven't read it yet, but I probably should. The Power of Modularity sounds very relevant. She's an economist, I believe. So she, she, model, she sees modularity as an economic force. Because when we have a lot of modules, we have options, she said. If you heard about real options, this is what she's talking about. <clears throat> she has even said that experimentation and recombination of these modules is the new game in IT. Maybe Microsoft is, um, is sort of in there somewhere. And for those of you who haven't read this book, it's, it's overdue. You should read it. it uh, it's a great book, of course, and it's, you actually got some real data on why this stuff actually works. But I love this quote because it, and that is because this comes from the book that is sort of hard on the Dora metrics. But what it says is a loosely coupled, well encapsulated architecture is the biggest contributor to IT performance, even larger than a test and deployment automation. I think that says a lot coming from the Dora metric people which is about how fast you can go to the production and all that stuff. So it's really interesting how important that is. So I, I would claim there is a consensus that modularity is beneficial, that we should strive for it. We have no data saying that actually it is. So there's no, I don't think there's a discussion that this is a good idea though. But as I guess I said, we're still struggling with this. I mean, the first ideas came up in the 70s. I'm going to see that later. But I think it is actually the hard part of what we do, is modularization. Yes, technical stuff and coding and all that, that's important, and it's hard, tricky, but it's not complex. It's complicated, to use Kinevin terms for those of you who know that. And just to illustrate what complexity is, I've sneaked this idea from Dave Snowden, actually, which is the Kin Kinevin guy, which is that when you throw a children's party. For those of you who have children and have had them at home, you know what he's talking about. You can't have KPIs and detailed plans and objectives, key objects and key results for your children's party. You can, but the plans are out the window as soon as the kids enter the home. From that on, it's damage control, right? It's good damage control because happy kids is cool, but it's still, you, you move into a different sort of way of thinking when you do that. And I think, Generally, we are quite used to working in situations like this. We actually enjoy it. OK, you were exhausted after a children's party, but you had a, it was fun, and the kids are happy, and everything is cool. Right? So we manage complexity a lot in our normal life. So when you suddenly, when you work, work into the office door, everything has to be ordered, and it's has to be predictable, and yeah, yeah, it has to be planned, and yeah. No, we are inherently good at this. So it's really weird that we can't do it in our daily business. So. Let's see what, what, what system thinking can tell us about how to deal with this complexity in a better way. And I'm actually then taking a wider scope than we have uh, until now. So just to uh, illustrate system thinking, a, a, somewhat, a somewhat decent way of doing it is looking at parts and holes. Right? It's, a, it's sort of a system. You think of a system as any set of relations uh, that has a boundary. There is a system. It has a boundary and there are some parts, and they form a whole. But again, you don't necessarily see a system, and this is something that we designed, it's something that is a framing that we use. We see it, oh, now I see the parts, now I see the whole, right? So you wouldn't necessarily see that unless you take on the system thinking cloak. So it's a new framing. So um, what this illustrates is that there are, there are parts, and the parts are interconnected, and they affect the whole. If you see one cog move, every, everybody else is going to move, of course, they're interconnected, and the whole is going to change when you do that, if you turn the direction, for example. So it's a good illustration of that. But I used cogs. <laughs> what are cogs a representation of? You can do system thinking and still thinking in machines. This is machine thinking. So yes, it's a system, but it's a specific time of system. It's actually a specific kind of world hypothesis, as somebody claims, and it's called mechanism. We see the world as a, as a machine. I mean, going back, to, science has done that for ages. I mean, Newton saw the whole universe as a clock. So full uh, uh, determinism, for example, that is something that, that comes from other science. So science is not good at system thinking, really, that, or they are good at that, well, top of, top, what that hypothesis of the world that is the machine model. 
Because I think the machine model is actually something that hinders us, that stops us. That's, the worst, that's why I come back to that. Uh, uh, thinking in plans and predictability and all that stuff. That is machine, because a machine, when you turn it on, it's going to work as you expected it to do. If, a if, if, if your car suddenly did something really weird, you would be very surprised. Right? So you assume determinism and predictability. That's, that's the machine me mechanism way of thinking. So then the parts are forming the whole. They are, the whole is actually the exact sum of the parts in a machine model. But do we want this? Do we want teams to work like this? Do we want our system to work like this? Do we want people, individuals within our team to work like this? No. We want people to be in the, somewhat independent, because then you create, the creati create creativity and learning. For example, somebody comes up, oh, we have to, we're going to change how we work. We're going to change this cog into a brilliant new cog. We're going to not do waterfall anymore. We're going to do agile, and we're going to do agile the right way. Follow the agile manifesto to the letter. That's probably good for the team at the moment. And it's inspiring and good, but it's probably going to hurt the rest of the cogs, because they're not going to fit. Which means that if everybody, if all the cogs optimize themselves for what they sell, what, what they think what is suitable for them, it's not going to create a better hole. It's actually going to probably ruin the hole. You see? And that is, that is the risk I think we do every time we do Agile and Agile transformations, is that we, we optimize some part and then don't optimize the rest, or jointly optimize the rest. And this is something, uh, I'm going to go back to that, but this is social technical, is that when we focus on the technical stuff, optimize that, but we ignore the, so the social stuff, you can actually ruin the system. If you, create, if you come in with a new technology, like SAFE, and everybody hates it, and everybody's going to leave a company, and the company ends because of that? It wasn't a good idea, was it? You didn't do, you didn't do a joint optimization between the social and technical. Yes. So I'm going to uh, nick a quote from a famous system thinker or a teacher. If you come across anything by him, look it up. Spend time with it. There's some actually a brilliant 10, 15 minutes TED talk by him. There was he was way before TED even existed, but look at that. Russell Aikoff's TED talk, it's actually amazing. He's got a good way of looking at the system. He said the system is, is actually never the sum of it, well, shouldn't be, never be the sum of its parts. It should be the product of the interactions, which means that parts are important, but it's the interaction between the parts that is actually creating sort of the emergence of a bigger system. He also has this quote, which I think really sets off your, your great matter. A system is more than some of its parts. He already said that, right? But again, it's an indivisible whole. It loses essential properties when it's taken apart. I'm not going to go into his argument for this, but just take his word for it. <laughs> so if you, if you have a, going back to that Coke model, if you take one part away and study that in isolation, you have actually ruined the system. You have taken away the essential properties. You're ignoring essential parts when you're doing that. And what do we do every day when we go to work? We analysis, right? We look at one part, ignore the rest. That's what we do, mostly. At least I do. I've done that for years. And I think that's some, somewhat... Uh, we come from a... At least I do, come from a STEM background. And probably most of you do that. And we have been drilled since we went into the first day of school, been drilled at this. This is how, we, that is how you do good science, people. You study parts, ignore the whole. Because, because that assumes the machine model. So it assumes that every part is going to, be a, uh, going to sum up to the whole. It's not going to be more than a whole. So it doesn't see this aspect at all. So what we are good at is reductionism, is what they call it. This is when we decompose our system, explain the parts, and then based on the explaining explanation of the part, explain the whole. Some whole. Parts, some whole. Right? But that is machine age. And I, as, uh, and I think uh, Eikhoff says, says it in all of its talks, that we have to move to the system age. So we need something else. It, not saying analysis is not useful. It is, definitely. But we need something else. And that is synthesis is needed. And that's actually quite the reverse of the, of the analysis idea. What you do then is that you actually go up one level. If you wish, say if you wanted to understand that system over there, 
Then you have to understand what is that system part of? What's the containing whole of that system? So you're putting things together, then you explain the whole, and then you explain the parts. Exact reverse of analysis. You have to go one up, at least one level up, and then go back down again afterwards. So an analysis, in a way, focuses on structure, how things work. But while synthesis, that explains why things work as they do, because you understand it in the context, the containing hope. And I think that's one of the bigger reasons why modularity fails. Because we focus on parts. We not, it's not saying that we ignore the whole, but often we work in a system where we are not able to see the whole. So we do as best as we can, and we focus on the part. Your team or your system that you know. This part of your, if you bigger, say if you are a layered architecture, you're focused on a database because that's where you work, so you ignore the rest. So you're just trying to survive, basically. Because the organization, the system is wrong. It can be blunt. Yes, and uh, by the way, uh, the, uh, uh, when you're thinking systems like this, uh, again, remember that I used this Cox model. It's, it's not a good model, it's a machine model, but still. But it shows the hierarchy of systems. There are systems within systems within systems. But there is actually more uh, things that are relevant here. <clears throat> so one is the containing whole. But uh, this is, uh, is uh, Donella Meadow. She's also a well-known system thinker. Uh, for those of you who have read the book, uh, Thinking in a System, that's also a good starter. For, it's actually called a primer for system thinking. But what she says here is that a system is a set of interrelated elements that are organized to serve a particular function or seek a particular goal. And the latter part here, this seeking, having a function and seeking a goal, is actually really interesting. So interesting that I'm not, I don't think Eikhoff pulled it from Donella, but he, thinks, he, he talks about purposefulness, which is the, basically the same as having a goal. The, uh, the system has a purpose. And from, uh, in it, uh, he probably, this is a collection of his work, so I'm not sure where this comes from, but it's in this book anyway, where he sort of um, describes a set of uh, system types, if you like, archetypes. And he's basing that that's, uh, topology on the purposefulness of, of, uh, of, so of the system and its parts. So he has the, the, the lowest level, so to speak, is the deterministic part. That's the machine again, right? That's where the parts have no purpose, your, uh, your engine and your, your starter engine and, and, your, and your brakes and your steering wheel and a car doesn't have a purpose. It has a function, but it doesn't have a purpose. It, it doesn't say that I want to take this my own or two. Right. There, there's no purpose there. And, and, and the whole doesn't have a purpose. Your car, again, your car doesn't, or at least not yet. At some point, we may have general AI and the car can actually self-drive. But until then, they don't have a purpose. They don't want anything. So they are a deterministic system. And then he said, oh, okay, based, if, you, if, you, if you put purpose on the whole then, then you get a an animated systems. Where the parts doesn't have a purpose, but the whole has a purpose. Like you and me. I, hopefully, have a, you probably have a purpose, all of you. There's something that you want. Out of life, not in general, but there can be just small things that work. I want to reach that goal. I want to be that, become that person or whatever. You have a purpose. But your hearts and your lungs doesn't have a purpose. It's just there for a function. And then you've got social systems, like a team, like your company, like uh, your community, like uh, any social organization, your family. They all for, for consist of the animated uh, elements. So this is hierarchical, by the way. <clears throat> so the, the parts have uh, purposes, and the whole have purpose. And then you also have yeah, ecological. I'm not going to go into that because I've got time. But, um, we're gonna f but the thing is that I think we often, we sort of agree that we are working in a social system. I don't think anyone disagrees that we are working in a social technical system when we go to work. Of course, there are social aspects and technical aspects. But we solve it as a deterministic system. We reach for that machine model as soon as we can. Because we've been drilled as a science, you want to get rid of the human as soon as you can. If we're going to do an experiment, get rid of the wetware. Because that's not predictable. Right? So the thing is, the parts have humans in them. And that makes it a social technical system. And it makes modularity a lot harder. Because uh, you, should, you remember that, um, that, that sort of the changing cog uh, I showed earlier? Now you have a whole team of people that change all the uh, time. Maybe the day before they had a children's party and exhausted when they come to work the next day. 
Or maybe the neighbor got hit by a bus the day before and are detrimental when they come to work next day. Or maybe they have um, had an epiphany, they went to a DevOps conference and listened to a talk about mm, and wanted to do that. And the whole team said, no, 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 we have to try this tech, it's so cool. So uh, things change all the there's no predict predictability whatsoever when you do that. So it can't be reduced to a technical problem. So the parts are purposeful, that's the point. So when you look at the teams, I'm not, again, I've, I'm not going to run late uh, over today, hopefully. So I'm going to be quick, but I, uh, I have other talks about this because uh, the teams and the organization actually what is called an open system, which means that it's fully exposed to, to the uh, environment. Last, like, like I said, what you have, what the experiences that you have when, or that the feeling that you have, you bring your whole self to work. And that changes uh, the way you look at things. Um, yes, I haven't got time for that today. So how can, uh, but still, we want to modularize, right? Still, there is a good reason for doing that, even though how complicated or complex as it looks, how can we then do it? And I think we can, we can have, have guidance and then looking at things in, like in this ge in ge um, geological folds, there are fracture planes, shared layers between things that we can look for that can help us. Of course, we are not geologists and we not work in those time scales, but how does that fit in our line of business? There are different things we can look for. Because as I said, a company is inherently a social system. So we can use fractions within the company, and this is just an illustration of, of course, the, what happened in America last year. Uh, you see what fractions does to people. People um, rally around things that they agree on, that they are feeling a group, groupness, right? Group thinking. I think Gregory Bateson called it, actually coined a term for this, schismogenesis. We create us and them all the time. We are the Java people. We don't hate .NET people, <laughs> stuff like that. I've actually spoken to both NSC and, and Java type of conferences, and there is a difference. So there is a, that divide is still there. I hope it goes away soon, but still. But you can use this fraction to your advantage when you motorize. And this is basically what team topology did, I think, with these teams types. Because you have a streamlined team. If you are burning for your business, if you want to really, really want to meet the customers and help them and fix their problems, Join the streamline team. This is where that stuff is going to happen. If you care about tech, if you're deeply into Kubernetes or whatever it is, if you, your cloud is the coolest thing ever, then well, maybe you should join the platform team. Right. The same with the other type of teams. If you're a coach, maybe you should join an enabling team. If you're really into uh, AI and machine learning, maybe you should join the complicated system team. I don't know. Depends on context, of course. But you see, there is a uh, a tractor here that you can see where people move and stuff like that. But how has this traditionally been done then, modularity? And I think you can go back to at least 72 with this paper by, by David Panas on the criteria to be used in decomposing system into modules. But also you have seen talks, for example, by Sam, Sam Newman. He has talked a lot about this. This paper brings that up quite a lot. So it's, that is very dated paper, but uh, the conclusion and what comes out of it is really relevant still because we do it all the time, probably every day. What they propose here then is that uh, one begins with a list of difficult design decisions or design decisions that are likely to change. Each module is then designed to hide those decisions from the others. Encapsulation, basically, right? So this is what we end up doing in object oriented, probably what you end up doing in microservices and all that stuff. You create package things, and then create an interface, and then hide it from the rest. But the thing is, this, this is hard to know beforehand when you start. It's a little bit of an emergent thing. You have to figure it out as you go along. So it's a black, like crossing the river, feeling the stones but kind of thing. So you, you don't necessarily know the end game. You don't know how they're going to look in the end. Uh, you don't necessarily have, be able to have an ideal how it'll look in the end even, because you don't know, basically. Put in the order, the big ball of mud paper again. They have something they call sharing layer patterns. It's different. Uh, they, they actually they use architecture from, from real architecture, from, from, from buildings, how building learns, this one, to look at what changes on different rates 
Like the site of a house doesn't change, hopefully, unless there's an earthquake or something. So that, that is very stable. The structure of the house changes less. Oh, sorry, it changes more frequently than the site, but still, very seldom. And then skin and interior, and there's a different change rate to things. So what I say there, there are the different change rates within your system as well, or your IT system. Like the data probably change more than your code. Uh, your, some parts of the code change more frequently than others. For example, like utilities change less than your business code, for example, and stuff like that. So you can use those to separate things. Again, I think it's rather emergent. You can't, it's hard to predict where things are going to be stable or not. So you have to try it out and figure it out. So that is what I often call bottom-up. It's like an emergent thing. Um, but it's a, it's a moving target, and I think you have to be agile in order to work in this way. And, that, and that's why agile, actually, there's a, one of the principles in agile manifesto is about this. The best architecture requirements and design emerge from self-organizing teams. Like that. So it's emergent. So, but it's hard to predict uh, beforehand. Which, then, which means that you have to be ready for not only refactorings, but actually big rewrites as well, as you learn. In the range of design, you have this called whirlpool where you sort of your domain, uh, you learn new things about your domain, and then you have to be ready to actually big rewrites as well. You can't just assume that you're on the right path. Maybe you have that, oh, this was completely wrong, we have to pivot, or whatever. Yeah. So I think we also need to help. We need some top-down. <clears throat> Not top-down, uh, this has to be an uh, ivory architect, <laughs> ivory tower architect telling us how to do things. So not that type of top-down. But as you showed earlier, with the system thinking, we have to go up at least one level and see how it works. So it's actually more of an open system, outside-in kind of thing. We have to see different views and perspectives of the whole thing. Let's see if we've got time for this. It's a, just a little anecdote. No, I haven't got time, sorry. But uh, if you haven't seen the series, but I love Neyman Rose, if you haven't seen the series, check it out. It's brilliant, because it follows the book quite closely. But I haven't got time for this, unfortunately. But uh, what he says is that you have to go to f from the outside, look it in, because you won't understand it when you're inside it, because it's like fish in water. He doesn't use the fish in water analogy, but it's the same thing. So uh, what sort of sign kind of themes can we look for in our business, <clears throat> apart from the teams and their factions, fractionality? We can look at the themes in the business models. And the thing is that uh, a business and again, an organization is a social system, so then you would actually see the whole if you do that. So uh, we are looking at techniques from a business perspective. Like, a, uh, like in this example is a business architecture, specifically business capabilities. So they defined, or Ulle Schoemann now defines a business capability. He's a dotnetter, by the way, if you don't know him. A business capability is a, is a particular ability or capacity that a business may possess or exchange to achieve a specific purpose or outcome. So this is an ability that the business has to have in order to, do, to reach a goal or an outcome or purpose. And this is called business capability modeling. And what it does is focus on what you want, not how you do it. So think of user stories and not your uh, solutions. It's a similar idea. So you would break up a company in this type of uh, different supplements, hierarchical, and, yeah, and all that stuff. And the thing is that Yes, these are all ideas that you may have, and the company may change, but the, the, sort of the core idea is that these parts are actually quite stable. You assume that you wouldn't change these unless the business priority changes. So it's fairly stable. But I, again, it will change, and it does change all the time. So um, it's, it's reductionistic, but it's reductionistic in a, oh, we, we think this is a good idea still. We know it's not the right model is going to change, but it's at least... A, good as it gets. And this is something that you did on, and uh, again, dot, dot .netter, Microsoft, uh, not, not Microsoft guy, but he's a dot .netter. And uh, the author of N Service Bus, for those who know, know that. Uh, there it says, uh, so you have the how, which is the business capabilities, and then say, so you can solve it. The how, so the what is the business capabilities, but, but you can solve it as a how, as a service. So he connects the business capabilities with how you, how you solve it. So you say that a service is a technical authority for, our, for, our, for business capability. So you try to align. It's a business IT alignment idea again. So it's just, again, a synthesis, but, but with the business perspective. And then we have domain driven design. Something, as I said this before, but something good came out of, domain, of sorry, the COVID pandemic, 
people had more time on their hands. So there's a great group of people, that, that DDD crew, they call themselves. Uh, so there's a GitHub repo, which I recommend, github.com slash DDD crew, where they sort of describe how you would do a domain driven design approach. <clears throat> This looks very linear, right? <laughs> which is really, uh, somebody didn't like that, so they, I think they created this illustration now. So it's just to show that it's, iter it's iterative. But I, but I still like it as it is, though, because it shows that you have to sort of mentally at least go through some, some of this. So you have to align first, look at the business model, then you have to discover how this is, is going to look, then you, you decompose the system, like modularize it. By the way, many things that domain driven design is. It's down here. Oh, sorry, it doesn't work. Oh. Uh, the eight. I mean, I think domain driven design is there only, but it covers wider. If you read the whole book, the blue book, not the first part. So, uh, our technique you can use, which is really brilliant, this is event storming, which is great for this. Uh, was that you then look for things that what they call in domain driven design called bound context. And a uh, big picture event storming is actually a good technique for having, getting some ideas of what, what these. Uh, but the context are. If you do a huge, huge uh, event storm of a whole company, you would soon see uh, a grouping of, 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 of uh, stickies, Sorry, because it's a sticky technique, where you go, orange stickies. So then you can see, uh, probably get an idea of where for the, the, the themes are. The, and they call it pivotal events, this is the orange ones there. But again, it's a synthesis, because you, take, you get as many people as you, as you can into the same room and then agree on how this is looking. So you're taking a bigger picture. Um, if you want to read more about these techniques and others, I use a, uh, business capability mapping. I've written a, a chapter on that in this book. And also, there's a, I like user story mapping. That's a great technique for similar ideas when you're looking at the user perspective. Uh, it's a free book. You can, of course, pay and give for charity, but, uh, but uh, it's a, I recommend looking at it. It's a great community effort. So if you go back to this team illustration, so what do we really want? We want teams to be able to take a wider scope. So I don't think necessarily Scrum teams, but actually bigger. Because they have to own their own data. They have to own their own tools, like the systems that they create. And they have to own the processes that, that is cut across these systems or these uh, things. And all teams have to do that, because then they can be autonomous. <clears throat> And these are the modules. So these modules are necessarily, of course, then bigger because they include the social aspects as well. So they're not small technical things that are bigger. So the teams have to be bigger as well. Oh, uh, eight minutes. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's come to a close then. So I think emer the emergence can work if you do work bottom up. Uh, we have proved that uh, several times. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody's been successful at that, and probably the very few have. But, um, but we'll still try. Maybe somebody will manage to do that emergent thing. But I think it's really easy to, to get into a situation of action where you break in a monolith, for example, that you break it in such a way that it actually ruins the whole system. Distribute the monolith, anyone? Right. So if you, you can pick one pick bit and one pick bit and one pick there, and then you don't see the hole, you just pick, 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 and you have no idea where you're going. And if you do emergence as that, you, you sort of have to cross the river by feeling the stones. You, have, you, you can't stray then. You can't just take a detour. You have to follow that path. So it limits you in a way. So I think we have to, in order to cope with complexity, we have to do both analysis and synthesis and get as many, pers as many perspectives as we can, get a hold on. And that's probably tricky for some of you if you're stuck in a back-end team somewhere, on a database team or a middleware team or whatever, to, to get this possibility, the, the, the ability to do that. But I would suggest that you do, because you create better systems when doing that. There's a bigger chance of you actually to managing it. So at the company level, you definitely should do this. Be top down, upside in, holistic, and all that. So see as much as the system as possible. Get the wider picture. Not bigger front design, mind you. This is about understanding and discovery. Mm -hmm. So look at the business goal, look at the business model, you look at the user needs, uh, look at the business architecture. Get as many perspectives as you can. And remember, uh, that's what actually a gotcha I have for domain driven design. They talk about a lot, a lot about the domain expert. Like there's some god in the room that can tell you how the, everything is going to work. So the team just listen to him, put him or her, and then everything is going to be fine. No. That's only one perspective. You need more than that. Even the developers have a lot to say in this. 
the technical people they are probably more uh, let's say more creative often than the domain experts on how to do it. Oh, we could do this and that and technology and this and that. Oh, I never thought of that stuff. So cooperation in a multi-school team. So instead of that broken uh, pane of glass I showed earlier, maybe we should try to reach something like this. This is from the uh, Niederstrom in Trondheim, by the way. So I think we, we, need to, we need to get that bigger picture. We need to get all the perspective as we can. And maybe actually creating somewhat of a map the way we want to go, so like, the, like the domain map or the basic building map or something like that. So we have somewhat of an agreed direction where we want to be, because then you can actually stray from the path. Because you know, oh, we have that domain over there and that domain. Oh, let's do something there and something there. But uh, again, you do both analysis and synthesis, and you have to iterate this stuff. Because again, it's, it, we mustn't fall into the trap of thinking reductionistic again. Oh, this is, we have found a perfect model. Now it's are saved. Next day, the uh, COVID hits and everything changes. So everything can, you don't assume that it's stable. So build in our organization capability to actually do maneuver, to be adaptable. And this is a core thing about open systems. I hope I can come back later and talk about open systems. Because what you have to do there, you have to be adaptive. And not only that, you have to be actively adaptive. You can't just sit and take it. You have to be on it. So I think we have to leave back to that good fences make good neighbors. In order to do that, we have to, take, we have to realize that we are more than a technical system. We are a social technical system. And it's bigger uh, than the tech. And there's always the, and, and, and people in. So we need, to, we need to bring in system thinking, I think. We need to, as uh, Akov, I think Akov said that. We have to leave the machine age, move into the system age. And he said that many years ago. Because there's, I, if it, system thinking came about after the war, and this is where they start seeing this stuff. So it's, uh, it's quite old stuff, really. And there's a lot of strands, and I recommend looking into the social technical system, specifically, many strands. So I think uh, if we create this good, Permanent boundaries. They are not hard, they're not silos. They are kind of open, like the stone fences that I showed earlier. Wild animal can cross them and there's no problem. If you create that, I think we can create systems that are more than the sum of its parts. Because then we have moved out of the machine age model and thinking more holistically, and then we're going to get the effects of, of the, in, in the integration. So by understanding the connections and the purposefulness of the parts, I think we actually can get to that idea that uh, Ekov had is that the, the, the system is no, no longer the sum of its parts, it's like the product of their interactions. Yes. I think with that, I want to thank you so much for your attention. Um, we have three minutes, maybe some time for questions, but if you don't, if there's no questions, we, you can always reach me on Twitter and LinkedIn and other places. I usually use Tron Jucht as a tag there. Uh, but before we get into and um, have some time for q and I, I want to ask for your help, actually. I'm doing some, since I've said I've been into social technical system, I, I, that it's a deep rabbit hole to didn't dive into. And I end up meeting a few other social scientists. And they're really interested in, in how the, our industry works, because they, they are coming from this, they come, they come from social sciences, of course. They don't really don't know about our business, or the IT. But I think there's a good hope here. And also they see the agile transformations and all that stuff. So we're actually running an industrial level organization health and innovation survey to see how well are we doing as people in our industry. Um, say if you have done a transformation, how well has that gone for you? How, how has that made you feel? And if you haven't done anything, how does that make you feel? And all that stuff. So uh, it's just a di di diagnosis of, of, of the industry, and it might be some real science coming. Not from this, there's no real science coming from this, it's just a survey. But there might be some uh, seriously inter interesting stuff coming out of this at some point, I hope. Because the social scientists are really interested in what we're doing. So, I, actually, they like our what they call it, anarchistic way of thinking. <laughs> um, that that we start, actually try, we strive ourselves to try to be, make something better. Uh, U.S. Brits, you probably heard of social technical because of the Tavistock Institute and all that. So there was the miners in uh, in the coal mines that decided, oh, we don't, we can, can't care about this me mechanistic way of working. We're gonna decide ourselves how we're gonna solve this problem. I think. Our industry has a lot of those people still. That's why Agile exists. So, yes. Any questions? Yes. Could you? Sorry. Just as he can get a mic for you. I'm getting old. I can't hear you so much. <laughs> 
<laughs> and also with the, anyone on video. Sorry, this is, this is just a quick question about your survey. Yes. Um, you're advertising it in a very biased space right now because we're all here because we're already either want to innovate or are you know, either dissatisfied in the spaces yeah. where we want to innovate. Um, are you advertising anywhere else? Because you're going to get very biased data otherwise. Oh, you're thinking about the survey? Yes, sorry, this is just about this specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got another question. Um, yes, and actually, uh, we are running uh, into a bit of a problem now because uh, this is open for anyone in our industry. And from the data we have so far, it's very top heavy. <laughs> we see a lot of managers and top level executives filling on the survey. Very few at the bottom of the hierarchy. So we need oh, more. I'm just a software that I have, yeah. Yeah, so we need more of you coders to fill in, so you get the more balanced. I'm just wondering if you're going to get responses from people who want change, not necessarily responses from people who are already satisfied. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, this is an assist survey. It doesn't say what you want. It's how how is how are you doing? Yeah. All right, and I do actually have a question about your talk. Yeah. Um, I'm currently in a space that's actively recruiting, so we're about doubling the size of our team, which introduces interesting problems because on one hand, you get a lot of diversity, you get a lot of new thought, yeah. but you are fundamentally changing the size of the team. And this also seems to be part of the problem with, you're speaking about these systems, which are, as an ecosystem, very fragile. Yeah. And in a way, you do want to keep them stable, but you need diversity to keep them alive. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, exactly, and I completely agree, like because uh, I didn't go into the team setup, but you need multi-skilled teams. You, need, you, you can't have a person being really good at one thing. You need to be able to diversify the team. So maybe you coders actually have to do some UX, or maybe you should do some testing. Because you have to be able to, uh, not only for redundancy, because the redundancy should be in the function, which is the people in the team, but also because then you together as a team can write around some new things that you all agree on. There's nobody telling you how to do stuff. Right? So that also becomes the, into hiring. So the teams would be larger than we normally think it would be. I don't know if it answers your question. Yeah, I'm just wondering, do you have like a size in mind? I guess that depends very much on the space. Well, uh, from, uh, again, for social sciences, there is no size limit. There is no Dunbar number there. <laughs> I don't think any social sciences will actually say that Dunbar uh, is a good thing. But um, so, um, and also, I hear that a lot because they say, oh, you can't be more than five or eight or something like that. Because they, but then you assume that everybody had to integrate all the time. But they don't in a team. Yes, they rally around some things in workshops and stuff like that, but otherwise they work in, in isolated pockets. Hopefully more than one, the pairing, for example. And, and uh, ensemble programming and stuff like that. But, don't think of, because if you don't have UX, for example, if you don't have the business people actually in your team, you don't see the whole system. You only see your pocket. And I think we need to take charge of that ourselves as well, not just hoping that somebody fixes this at some level. Because the, I'm sorry, the CEOs and the middle management are probably not going to help us with this. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Time's up, unfortunately. But again, just reason I'm going to be here for the remainder of the day. So look for me. Okay. Thank you.